start this program, we got Dale Wilbur. It's been a contributor for us for well over a year now. Uh, on now you're talking, and then we got Claudia Thomas. But she is the, the person that heads up, starts, and manages a, a group. And it's a website called 9-11 rescueworkersandfriends.org. And, uh, and Claudia has been on, uh, now you're talking on Mondays, and uh, for the past few weeks. And uh, she has had some guests on uh, to join us that have been it has been on site at the 9-11 site in New York City. And uh, these people have communicated their, uh, uh, their experiences, which is, which is just uh, amazing. They put themselves at huge risk. And unfortunately, in some cases, our government is not uh, providing the necessary uh, support. Uh, when these folks helped others, they aren't stepping up and making these folks feel like, okay, you did your duty. Thank you for uh, helping these families and, and uh, these people out. And uh, there was there was some risk of uh, losing some of the um, health care uh, revenue or money or support from our government. So Claudia, being who she is, uh, you know, she's put together an organization to help be a mouthpiece for these people that put themselves at risk, and we were introduced to Claudia from Dell, and somehow or another, you guys knew one another. I mean, I'm blown away who Dell knows, and uh, he uh, he just says, "Well, I know this person, and you know this is what they do, and would you guys be interested in having her on your show?" And I'm going, "My gosh, yes!" And uh, so. Who wants the floor here? Do Claudia or Dell? Do you want it? How do you want to start? How you guys uh, got to know one another? If you can share that, and um, well, go ahead. If, if Dell doesn't mind, I, I'll start out here a little bit because the very first thing I'd like to mention today, and, and you know, I'm not going to talk politics. That's just not not what we do. Um, but today is the sixth anniversary of the terrorist attack that took place in Fort Hood, and so I just want to take a moment out to remember the 14 people that were murdered and the over 30 that were injured in that terrorist attack because it's, it's the right thing to do. And that's what we're all about is love and the right thing to do. So God bless them and, and we keep their families and friends in our prayers. Thank you, Claudia. And as for Dell, well, Dell and I have known each other for, oh my gosh, Dell, what is it? I'm guessing we've known each other for what, about 10 years, Dell, thereabouts? Somewhere, yeah, I think back uh, probably around 2004, 2005, somewhere around there is when we uh, we first uh, uh, met each other. So, uh, so yeah, it's 10, 11 years. And Claudia. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, was a good man. I, I listened to all of his um, his uh, town halls. I, I read all of his articles, and he's got um, some amazing insights on some things. We're, we're respectful friends. We disagree sometimes, but the one thing that I always appreciate about uh, with Dell is it's always about the bottom line of respect and loving one another. And he's a remarkable guy, you know, give the guy credit for credit's due. He's really been a good friend, and I can't thank him enough, and or you folks, for giving us this opportunity to let the 9-11 family voices be heard, because we got a lot to say. You do? Yeah. I think it's just important that... Uh, not only is is uh, you know what uh, what Claudia is involved in a worthy cause, but just excuse me, but just the uh, the fact that uh, uh, as as the day 9/11 is fading more and more you know, in people's memories, uh, we just need to keep it uh, uh, keep it out there because uh, you know that was a such a significant date in the history of this country that. You know, it should never be forgotten what, what was done to us as a nation, what happened. And, uh, uh, you know, we can't allow the, the coming generations of that to, not to, to understand and know what it was all about, know what happened, and, and recognize the, the importance of American history. So uh, it's, it's definitely a, um, a subject that needs to, uh, to continue. And, and like I said, Claudia's group certainly needs the, uh, 
you know, the support net that they can get, uh, hopefully get from uh, from uh, legislation and that to, to help them out for all of their uh, patriotism and, uh, and and work that they did uh, following the attack. So. Well, and I know, Del, one of the questions, and, and I ran this by Dave earlier, too, that I'd sure like to hear you share with the folks is, um, where were you on 9-11? I mean, what were your impressions that day? You know, I I actually did not uh, find out about it uh, right away. I I had a uh, doctor's appointment that morning, and I got up, and I it was like 9 o'clock that morning or whatever, uh, central time. And uh, so the, I, I believe by then both planes had, had hit the towers, and uh, 9 or 9.30 is when my appointment was. And I got up that morning, I didn't even turn the television on, I was just cutting around the house and getting ready. And uh, I went uh, into the doctor's appointment, and um, I was visiting my dermatologist. I, I've had some bouts with skin cancer, and I was there for, uh, to get some biopsies done. and. Uh, Love to be a lesson, everybody. Make sure you wear sunscreen, okay? You're not my scarred up face is living proof of uh, of the ravages that the sun can cause. But anyway, I uh, got into the doctor's office uh, in the examining room, and when the uh, the doctor came in, he you know greeted me, and he says, "Boy, he says, what do you what what do you think about you know everything that's going on?" And I kind of looked at him dumbfounded. I I didn't know what he was talking about, and. Uh, they briefly, you know, told me what had happened, and I, I couldn't believe it. And I, of course, when I finished the doctor's appointment, that I ran straight home and flipped on the television, and uh, and then, you know, found out about it. So that's kind of my story from uh, from then. But uh, but I was obviously, as, as most Americans were, I was really really troubled by what happened, and that's when um, I began to look at, you know what opportunities I could do that, uh, you know, uh, I initiated contact with my former employers and uh, and uh, was told basically to stand by and, and uh, along with many others, I'm sure, and uh, we um, just kind of waited around to see what was going to happen and, uh, and then eventually it led me over to Iraq, so. Wow. So and you were training uh, police officers over there, weren't you, Joe? Uh, part of the time, uh, you know, I did uh, actually did the interrogations and uh, uh, train the uh, um, Iraqi uh, police cadets and uh, worked with the, the major crimes unit that uh, basically was uh, was involved with uh, hunting down the deck of cards. Most wanted uh, former regime uh, members or whatever, and uh, and then uh, the last uh, last year I was over there, I did uh, the um, counter IED uh, investigations with uh, uh, working on General Aero staff. So um, so it was uh, you know uh, three years over there that uh, you know were certainly uh, kept me busy and uh, you know and a lot of. Uh, a lot of uh, experiences in that, that that we both had because you certainly spent spent some time there as, as well as went on to Afghanistan. You know, we both yeah, I believe we may have been there at the we might have been there at the same time from from what we've shared together. Although we didn't actually meet while in Iraq, but we were both in theater, I believe, at the same time. Yeah, I, I think there was uh, in fact, if I remember right, there was one one of my uh, trips over there when I was actually I was coming back home and you were arriving and you were probably living in Tent City out there at Camp Stryker waiting for uh, transport to the Green Zone or wherever and uh, and I was probably transiting, you know, uh, flying out of there. So uh, we, we may have passed each other. <laughs> we, were, we were probably within a hundred yards of each other at one point or another. <laughs> I'll be coming and going on the same uh, C-130, I bet you. <laughs> yeah, could be, yeah. Well, well that for, for someone that never spent time in the military and listening to you guys, um, it's uh, fascinating to me. You know, did you, so you spent a period of time over there, Claudia, in Tent City, over in Iraq? 
Uh, yeah, actually, I didn't wind up having to reside in Kent City at all. Um, we were picked up at the Biop, which is the Baghdad International Airport, and then transported to our um, stations within the Camp Victory. And Camp Victory is divided up into a lot of smaller camps. And my first deployment, I worked with intelligence services and was with um, over in, um, I'm trying to think of the name of that part of the base. Isn't that strange? Slayer. Slayer, thank you. <laughs> yes. I was in Slayer the first time. And, and what kind of responsibilities What kind of responsibilities did you have over there, Claudia? Well, um, for the most part, a lot of administrative officer type functions. I would um, take care of our people. That included uh, uh, Department of Defense and Justice and DIA and other individuals coming and going in and out of theater make sure that they were taken care of. Uh, I did uh, all the intakes, um, looked for the linguists, the American hired uh, linguists. You know, many of the linguists that went over there to serve, and, and Del knows this real well also, they were Iraqis who escaped after the first Gulf War and then came over here and became American citizens and then went back to help us out with uh, translations and, and that type of work. And we lost them in the field serving right next to our soldiers out there, and really some remarkable Americans that they became and gave their lives for us. Dale has shared some experiences uh, with some of the people that he's worked with from Iraq, and uh, some, there you go, best way to put, put it, I mean, they were walking step by step with uh, our team, and they were fighting for America as well, so... And it, it, what always fascinates me about that is how you figured out who those people are. And I mean, that's a very unique, and I'm sure Bill mentioned, of course, the interrogation or, in, you know, the interviewing people. Uh, you figured out a way to decipher that. And that's part of what intelligence does. You know, it's to separate out. Um, and, and that's imperfect. I mean, if that were perfect, we wouldn't have had Fort Hood six years ago. And we wouldn't have had the, uh, what do they call it, blue on green or green on blue attacks within the bases over in Iraq and Afghanistan. So it's a, still an imperfect thing, but keep us much better protected than we would be otherwise. And they do do an excellent job of screening and uh, all those uh, uh, linguists that served out in the field, those American hired linguists, have to go through security clearances. So, and that's a pretty expensive process. So they didn't get out there easily. They had to go through a complete screening to the Department of Justice and other um, governmental agencies to even be allowed in the air. Well, at the time, ladies and gentlemen, at 9-11, Claudia, I think you should go through, since Dale shared his experience where he was at 9-11, can you share uh, with the audience where you were at the time and your involvement in the early stages after 9-11? Well, um, on 9-11, I was actually in my home out in the Northwest, and my son was living in Omaha at the time. I had just gotten off shift, and I must have got off shift a little early that morning because I had worked the midnight shift. Got home and received the phone was ringing. My son was on the phone saying, Mom, turn on the TV. And I said, well, honey, what channel? What are you talking about? Because, you know, I'd get home at 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning, and, you know, I, I do the things that anybody would do that gets home from a usual job at 5 or 6 at night. Do the dishes, you know, clean up the house. And he's, he's on the phone, Mom, turn on the TV. Well, what channel? He said, any channel. Because he knew that New York is my home. I had taken him and my daughter back um, to see New York. His, his family, uh, it, we're, they're all there. And so when I turned on the TV and saw the devastation of what was taking place, um, the first thing I did, I had already had... My vacation plans of a trip back home set up for October 3rd, I believe I was supposed to be leaving. And I knew that the planes were being grounded, so I started throwing things into my car. Started loading up the car. I called. I was working with the police department. Called the, uh, the chief over there. and said, look, I, 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 I'm loading up my car. I'm heading back to New York. And he said, do whatever you got to do. I said, well, I'll just take my vacation time a little earlier. Well, after a couple of dozen phone calls and one uh, particular to a man named Roland Candle, who ran the Critical Incident Stress Debriefing, or CISM, CISM, teams for New Jersey, I uh, spoke to him after calling family and everybody else frantically seeing who was okay and that. And uh, 
he asked me to stand down for a week until he could get things organized. He knew that we would be doing something. And so I stood back for a week, and as soon as I could get out, um, I went up flying back. And I extended my vacation to the max that they would allow me, and I spent a month uh, back there working at the site. Out of some of the satellite areas, um, I met some really remarkable people that provided counseling to all types of folks on, on the site. That would be uh, volunteers, uh, civilians, NYPD, FDNY, the EMS workers, Red Cross, Salvation Army, the military guys, um, that we provide peer support. And hey, Claudia, that, that worked. Yeah, Claudia. Yeah, can I interrupt for just a second and just ask if we can all recognize a, a moment of silence because at 134, which is what my clock says, was when the Fort Hood attacks took place. I'm sorry that I interrupted you, but I just uh, kind of felt no, like... Oh, uh, absolutely no apology. That was perfect. Like Thank you so much. Thank you. And, uh, you know, it's uh, a simple, a little gesture maybe, but it's, uh, you know, it's something that, uh, you know, we, we can always uh, we can always do to... Just like we recognize when 9-11, uh, you know, the anniversary every year, and they ring the bell and, and read the names up in New York. I mean, that's, uh, you know, it's something yeah. that... Uh, we do, uh, I think, continue to do so. Anyway, go ahead, Claudia. Well, thank you for that. That's very much appreciated, very timely. Thank you so much. Um, let's see, so uh, I guess I was talking about walking the site and talking to a wide variety of different people and providing counseling. And that counseling also included, because I was under the authority of the Port Authority at the time, the, uh, going to their remote sites. That would include Port Authorities responsible for all the bridges, the tunnels, the airports, and uh, a variety of, of different tents. They owned the site, and so uh, uh, they really were running the show in a lot of ways. Well, one of the persons that I visited uh, was uh, Will Nino, and I'm not sure um, if that's ringing a bell right off hand, but if you ever watch the movie The World Trade Center, or you're familiar with any of the uh, uh, articles and the, the things that were coming out at the time, Will was one of two Port Authority police officers that had been trapped uh, underneath the building and, and was downed by a Marine, uh, Jason Thomas, uh, who found them and, and they were subsequently rescued. Uh, John, at the, that day that I went out to council, was still in a medically induced coma and Will had just been woken up from his. Now, that movie, The World Trade Center, and I'm not going to get into other impressions about Oliver Stone, but on this movie, he hit it 100%. The story that you see in the movie, The World Trade Center, is Will's story. All the way to his vision of seeing Jesus when he was down in that pit, when he was buried and he watched his friends die. It's an amazing story and I highly recommend it because that, that is uh, so representative of the bravery and the camaraderie and the love uh, from, from all of us within the 9-11 family. So, uh, I was fortunate enough and blessed enough, and Will and I are still good friends. Just saw him a few months ago. Wonderful people. And there's uh, so many other people. There's, uh, and, I, and I hope to bring them on, you know, as time allows on your shows, because their stories are so deserving to be heard. And one thing that's important to me also is having those people that maybe their stories haven't ever been heard, like Jackie Lopez, who was on a couple of weeks ago and lost her husband. 9-11 related cancer and watched him slowly rot away over a period of three years. Only having been married a year and a half and then watching him slowly die from the 9-11 cancer that he got. Or um, uh, Michelle Mason who was on last week and her experiences of what it was like that day. You know, these are people whose voices aren't getting heard and aren't really out there in the press and they have so much to share and we're going through so much pain. We just lost another member yesterday. And that is um, uh, heartbreaking. Every time we uh, go through one of these losses, and they're happening almost every other day now. Uh, this is uh, Chuck Karen, who was um, just an amazing young man. He's only in his 40s. He was behind young children and a wife, and he died of 9-11 cancer. And yet we've got politicians that are not stepping up to the plate or trying to change the rules at the last minute. And that's just not right. We're sick and we are dying. 
and we just launched a truck yesterday. There's, uh, I mean, there's a lot of stories from 9/11 that I, I don't, that I think, you know, what Paul you're doing, and, and like I said, just by by keeping the, you know, the event in in you know in the minds of, of people, um, you know, there's uh, I don't know if, if any of you recall uh, the name Rick Rescola, and I, or Rescola, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but uh, uh, are you a Dave or Jeff so familiar with him? Uh, the name sounds familiar, but I don't, I can't picture. Circumstance that you're going to probably talk well, he about. Well, he was he was a a security director for one of I don't I don't recall of what what uh, whether it was the entire facility or whether it was just a, a business within the, the trade center complex. But uh, he was, uh, if you remember, uh, Lieutenant General Hal Moore, uh, the uh, who wrote the book and and subsequently the movie was made of uh, We Were Soldiers Once and Young. Uh, Rick Riscorla served under him during the Battle of the Adrang Valley in uh, Vietnam and was awarded the Silver Star, Bronze Star, Purple Heart uh, as a uh, result of his military service. And he, he, after he left the military, he uh, ended up being in the uh, World Trade Center when, uh, when the attack took place. And there's accounts of him uh, making you know, several trips uh, back into Trade Center to escort other people out, and uh, and then uh, you know, of course, un unfortunately, I mean, the, the towers collapsed uh, on one of his uh, one of his trips back in to uh, to rescue more people, and uh, he was killed. But uh, you know, those are the types of, of stories of that, that that people need to hear about because you know the one that, that uh, Claudia just uh, just related to that, uh, you know, and I've, I've actually. I've, I've, Need to uh, to get off my lazy rear end and do it, but uh, I picked up that movie some not too long ago and uh, just haven't gotten around up to uh, to watching it yet. So I, I need to do so. But uh, like I said, there's a lot of stories out there of, of what took place, you know, during and after that uh, the public needs to hear about because uh, there were um, a lot of heroes uh, uh, involved and uh, you know Claudia being one. So. And we need to remember oh. them, and we need to remember them, and uh, uh, and try to, uh, to keep the memory alive and do what we can help. And, and Corey, well, Rick Rescorla was just such an amazing guy. Do you know that he saved? He actually was working. Um, I believe it was director of uh, security for Morgan Stanley, and he had come up with plans, and he's attributed with saving almost 2,700 lives that day. Like Will, like Dell said, he, he was going in and out and in and out, and. Then, Gave his life as the ultimate gift in saving 2,700 people. And probably yeah, more. That's just the numbers they attribute. Here, here's a guy that, that survived the, uh, you know, the battle in the Idrang Valley that uh, that is uh, uh, shown or depicted in, the, in that movie uh, with uh, Mel Gibson's movie, We Were Soldiers. And, uh, you know, to, to survive that that battle, uh, mm -hmm. as well as I'm not sure many other Many other fights that uh, that occurred during his service in Vietnam, and that, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, it, it's obvious that uh, you know his his character and, and the heroism that he displayed wasn't uh, uh, wasn't reserved for the battlefield, but uh, you know, it, it also carried over into his uh, his civilian life. Well, you know, and he predicted those attacks would take place too, and that's why he was so prepared, and that's so much a part of how he was able to save so many lives because he was prepared. People need to be prepared still, sad to say, but that's, that's the way it all works anymore. So, Claudia, I mean, your goal with this, your time on Now You're Talking, which is we're going to separate the segment and we're going to create your own time slot. Your goal is to, and if I can speak for you a little bit, is to have folks as guests on your segment with, that have firsthand uh, knowledge or experiences. Uh, you know, with 9/11 in the aftermath of 9/11, is that is that your goal? Yes. Yes, and uh, for right now, until we can get the Zadroga bill out onto the floor for a vote, this is our main concentration right now. Uh, it, this is an important piece of legislation, and we really need it to just get to the floor. The official count right now is 243 uh, representatives. 
there was just eight more Republicans that have signed on, and this was after um, Representative Goldblatt's um, new proposition, which is, which is we already talked about. It. I'm not going to go there. But we've had eight more sign on for our 1786, which is the bill that needs to go through. We have the majority. We have 62 senators on the Senate side. That's filibuster proof. Let's get it out to the floor. Let's get on the phone and, and tell our new speaker, Mr. Paul Ryan, that this needs to move out to the floor. That this is the right thing to do and there's no sense in holding it up and, and playing politics with our lives. Because we've got our health program already ended October 1st. Now, what little money is remaining in that fund, we're all going to start getting letters here in the next few months um, that we're, we're no longer going to have our health coverage. And so I, I, I would inquire and implore everyone to say, get on the phone, call Mr. Ryan's office, call uh, Mitch McConnell's office and say, get this out on the floor, let's move it to a vote. You know, tell, I mean, we need to tell the, the Congress and that, I mean, if, if they can, can authorize you know, spending, uh, you know, $10 million to study the sex lives of the California dung beetle, you know, then, uh, I mean, for crying out loud, you know, we can we can pass this legislation. And all the money that is wasted on on completely undeserving and, and frivolous uh, things that, uh, that we spend money on in this country, I mean, and this is something that is, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's a national obligation and... Uh, you know, it's something that, uh, that just needs to be done. So. Well, let's, well, Claudia, take people through, and not, not in a specific detail, because you'll get involved in that with your uh, guests that you have on your show, and in a broad spectrum, these people, uh, you know, the kind of health issues that they're having and the quantities of people that are having health issues. Well, currently we have, it's over... Um, 33,000 that have multiple health issues. So that means more than one health issue related to their service at the World Trade Center or survivorship at the World Trade Center. We have over um, over 4,000, I think it's up to about 4,300 that are certified right now with cancers, related cancers. Uh, those numbers are, are sadly fastly growing. Over 70,000 people are part of the health program. Um, uh, and we expect to see the numbers, especially with cancers and deaths, rise. Uh, by my um, calculations, and I do extensive research on our losses, and we have over 1,800 who have died from 9-11 related illnesses. That's almost, it's not going to be long at all before we surpass the 2977 that we lost, 9-11. We're already up to 1,800. And we're just now getting those latency periods for specific cancers like mesothelioma, which we know we're going to start getting hit with. They're all fine and work. You know, we women, we don't care about anything but, but the mission at hand. And that was going in to try to rescue people, provide comfort, and we're still doing that today. So all those 1,800 that have died, and those are only the ones I know of. I'm sure the numbers are even higher than that because a lot of people that aren't in the health program or I uh, haven't been able to come up with um, through my research. So that's a pretty fair estimate of 1,800 dead cents. And they're murdered. And I can't say that often enough. They are murdered just as much as those folks that died 14 years ago. These people were murdered too. And we took care of those families then. We need to take care of the families now. It's yep. the right thing to do. And hands down, I mean, this should be absolutely the priority. It's it's those people that, uh, to borrow from Dale's philosophy, that are that think of America and their fellow uh, American as bigger than themselves, and uh, and they just step up no matter what, and they put themselves at risk. And they didn't know that they were, did they? They didn't know. You know, I mean, they just... No, we were actually told the air was safe, and um, you know, I think from from my background as a firefighter and medic and, and other areas, I'm also a hazardous materials tech. Going into that site and just smelling it, you cannot describe the smell. If you weren't there or in the area, there is no way that you can understand the smell. It, it was such a uh, uh, carcinogen um, based odor that was permeating our lungs, it was absorbed through our skin, it was digested through the food. It, we were exposed in a mil million different ways. There's no way that that stuff was good for us, and yet we were told at the time it was that, that there was no, no issues. 
and the equipment wasn't there to protect us. Well, and we had a mission, and we were going to do that mission regardless. Ladies and gentlemen, that we've got uh, Claudia Thomas with uh, 9-11 Rescue uh, on the uh, on the show with us today, and Dale Wilbur is how we met Claudia, and we're going to have a time slot for Claudia and this show, and I will post that on Reagan Radio Network's uh, programming tab here in the next few days, and uh, it's going to be a half hour long segment, and we're going to have it five days a week, and we'll update it anywhere from two to four times a month. And Claudia will choose people and guests that will join us to help define this, to keep keep this whole story in the, on the front pages of our of our mind. It's like Dale mentioned, you know. That's and then Claudia mentioned as well. You know, this Fort Hood situation that took place six years ago. We can't forget that. I mean, that's a tragic situation on our own soil. So, way to be, you guys. And I'll just make note here that we'll end this segment, but uh, for program, but we can carry on with conversation. So, Claudia, way to be. Just way to be. And, Dell, thanks. thanks for introducing us. So, Dell, what else would you like to say about about this? I mean, how you, somehow or another, Dell, I mean, here you are, you're former CIA, you're in the know, you, you can't help yourself but to write about the events of what's going on in the world and the country. I mean, you are, you just got to write about it. And, uh, but this story with Claudia and these folks has to really be on the top of your list as far as uh, uh, staying in touch with. Well, I mean, you know, I, the whole the whole situation. I mean, it, it, this is all an outcropping. I mean, everything is is uh, an outcropping or, or a result of uh, what happened on 9/11. And you know, when you think about it, I, I I don't know if Claudia was there or not, but I recall. Vividly recall, and if for all his faults or policy differences or whatever that people might you know might have, uh, I clearly recall George W. Bush standing on a pile of rubble in New York, and him basically telling the world that you know that the United States that were involved in a, in a war, unlike any other war we had ever fought, and that it was going to last a long time, and you know people have lost lost sight of that. And he told us way back then, you know, that this wasn't going to be like uh, World War II, where there was, uh, you know, uh, an ultimate goal of defeating Nazi Germany and, and Japanese imperialism and, and uh, you know, and bringing an end to their, uh, uh, their atrocities. And that, uh, you know, this, this is a war that is going to be ongoing for decades. And people have, I mean, it's obvious, you know, with the... When you look at what's going on in the world right now, that uh, uh, and in my opinion, the day that we uh, chose not to remain committed to being on the offensive and to taking the war to the uh, the Islamic extremists uh, is the day that we started losing that war, and we're seeing the the results of a. Uh, I hate this word because <laughs> everybody uses it now, but you know they call it a feckless foreign policy, and uh, you know it's. Uh, but it's I guess it's apt because uh, you know we uh, we certainly have experienced that uh, that type of uh, of a relationship uh, in the world. That uh, war continues. There are people out there fighting and dying right now on battlefields in different parts of the world. Uh, you know, facing a, uh, a very, very difficult enemy, and uh, you know, it's it's not going to stop. So, um, you know, the more we talk about it and keep these things alive, the uh, you know, the better, uh, better this country's going to be uh, in the end run for it. So, I'm just going to close with uh, with one statement. That's okay, Dave. Yeah. And that was what uh, Patrick Henry said many, many moons ago, and that's "United we stand, divided we fall." Let us not split into factions which must destroy that union upon which our existence hangs. I'm just going to leave it at that. Way to be. Way to be, Claudia.